Welcome to another conversation with the Apostate Sisters. I'm Patty, and I make this podcast with my sister, Nancy. We grew up in a doomsday cult called the Worldwide Church of God. We're also nerdy about history and culture, but critical of religion. So get ready to get mad or to nod your head in agreement as we embark on tonight's topic. Finally, we have arrived at what is actually the final episode in our series on the life and influences of Herbert W. Armstrong, the leader of our cult. And with that, I would like to raise a glass to Nancy (laughs) for all the great work you did preparing this. Cheers, Nancy. And you. And we're lucky enough to still be hanging out in the same house right now. So, yay. Well, Pat, the last episode, we started off with kind of how we felt about this um, whole timeline. And it brought up a lot of emotions that we didn't expect would. And therefore, we're having to record another episode because... Things got very emotional. Things got a little deep. Some of our traumas were coming out. We are going to be all down to business tonight, right? We're going to stop ourselves from rabbit trailing everywhere, our Mm -hmm. little heart's desire. Okay, not necessarily because we like to go off on tangents, don't we? Yes, but that's what got us in trouble last time. We were talking from the heart. We were even in tears at one point. And so if that happens to us, I'm sure that would happen to a lot of other people that were in the Worldwide Church of God listening to this stuff and a a lot patty a lot happened um in in the 90s when the church split apart i mean families split apart just like ours things spiraled out of control i was almost done with high school and my parents didn't show when you got married our parents didn't show it was a very emotional time i hadn't actually thought about those things in context i think we just accepted the idea that they're not like other people i mean i'm surprised they came to my wedding too they don't communicate with us really we have to be the ones to communicate with them so the thing that really makes me sad about our parents though is that i kind of feel like they're almost um a shell of people you know because here they've had all of these life experiences that didn't have anything to do with the church and what those life experiences added up to didn't really get to express itself through their life because they had this other, this ideology um, superimposed on top of it, kind of twisting the way they saw all those things that they actually experienced. And so I think it takes away from the fullness of their whole life experience. You know, in a way they threw away their chance at joy because they were expecting pain Well, and pain was welcomed in the worldwide church of God. I think that was equated with, um, with righteousness, with obedience. That's what they were taught. And so when they felt things like joy, um, it meant they were doing something wrong. They weren't on track. I think you're right. Yeah. Gosh, that's horrible, isn't it? Well, I remember feeling that when I was young, too. If I laughed at anything, I felt like I was doing something wrong. Like, it can't possibly be joy that I'm feeling because those are feelings that I'm not supposed to have. To finding our joy as adults? To finding our joy as adults. It's funny that I'm just right in the other room here recording. And, well, I, I came here for the SAFE conference, which was a lot of fun. We met some great people that were part of the cult recovery program. Yeah, I found the SAFE conference really useful, actually, in terms of thinking about what it is that we're trying to do with this channel and the broader goals that we have outside of, you know, just making content for clicks. Yeah, Because there there is a whole pile of people out there who grew up in the Worldwide Church of God and a whole lot of other things with similar high control features. And it causes really similar traumas and Um, things that we need to contextualize and heal from. We even met someone else from the Worldwide Church of God who thought it was pretty cool that uh, we were out here sharing what we're sharing. It it was definitely worth attending. I'd say 
uh, for anyone who is still struggling in um, religions of high control, that they go find someone to talk to within this community. Um, cult recovery it is a great place to start. And I guess we do have an announcement about our mother. Last we had reported, she was still with the Restored Church of God under David C. Peck, a horrible, horrible human being, uh, very manipulative, controlling, takes advantage of people, um, just just an absolute liar. Um, yeah, she was under his thumb for a long time. Our father had already been excommunicated, but we just called her on Mother's Day and found out she is now with Church of the Great God with our father, which... I understand is also a splinter church of the worldwide, but I want to say it's in a little bit better of a direction. It's not as high control as um, David CPAC is. I know that's not saying much, but I I'm happy where she's at now. That doesn't mean that we're going to stop talking about David CPAC. I feel that um, his teachings are extremely harmful and we want to see as many people get away from that indoctrination as possible so we are going to continue talking about the splinter churches you know i actually felt a little bit happy when we found out how that had all gone down because i never understood why mom stayed at restored when dad left mm -hmm. but come to find out it seems like she was kind of having her own minor rebellion against the headship of her husband, mm -hmm. which is kind of a big deal because she's just kind of put her head down and followed him around through all of the various um, cults and communes he's entertained. And in this instance, she was kind of like, no, dude, I didn't like how you handled that with Restored, getting your, your ass kicked out. She def definitely didn't say it that way. And she was mad. And so she used mm -hmm. her mad to put her foot down and decide she was going to stay, even though he had to go. So I'm kind of proud of her, I got to say. I feel like that is just a little piece of that oomph that she carries within her that's been so squashed down from 40, 50 years of indoctrinating herself into this. So... If there's just a little crack in, in that control system, I'll take it. You know, I also heard her say that the church she's a part of now, Church of the Great God, isn't so controlling because she flat out said that David C. Peck, oh, he's a little bit controlling, or I guess he's a little bit controlling. A little bit? I know. And we were like, um, okay. Gee, what gave uh, you that idea? <laughs> hopefully not listening to the podcast but no i don't know they um, might know about our podcast it's okay i'm okay with it <laughs> it is what it is now okay but what i heard her say is that she was getting out of restored because pack was a little controlling and over at the church of the great god they're more holy spirit led and you know i don't know what she means by that because as far as i know there's no evidence of a Holy Spirit of any kind. Oh, we know that. Um, but if she's saying that, I mean, does that mean people have the ability to um, use their intuition and or critical thinking skills? I mean, if it opens the door to that just a little bit, I'm kind of here for it. Mm -hmm. So it does feel like a little like one layer maybe has been peeled away of what's going on. Yeah. I mean, we can hope, right? It felt positive to find out she was no longer with Restored. Yeah. Again, it's a step. Um, and e mom even said, you know, it was she talked to people in the church and they all said, oh, how nice it was to meet uh, me and my husband. Because because we've been there. We've met quite a few people at um, uh, Church of the Great God because we've been to Feast of Tabernacles at Myrtle Beach with dad a couple of times. And so I think mom felt a little bit more of a connection to this church, you know, knowing that. Oh, they know dad. They've taken care of dad. They even bought him a car, Pats. Did you know that? They bought him a car. They all chipped in. And so I thought that was really nice of them. Again, I try mm -hmm. not to say anything bad about these people. Um, I know. Can I, I just, we, can I just though? Can I just, I'm sorry. You can. These are very indoctrinated people as well. I, I, I know. I don't think any of them mean don't mean well. We know people like Gerald Flurry of Philadelphia Church of God and David C. Pack of Restored Church of God are not good men. They're, they're I know, but I, I just have to say that 
buying a church buying someone a fifteen hundred dollar clunker with a pretty good guarantee of getting a good chunk of their income for the rest of their life after that seems yeah. like a pretty good business decision. I know. I know. I, I don't mean to say they don't mean well. I'm sure they do. But these things are just so baked in. It's just like our parents being indoctrinated into thinking that the way that they were treating their kids was love when in fact it was abuse. It's the same kind of thing. They're doing this. They believe it to be kind and it is filling a need and we should do those things for each other. But behind it is this motive, this outcome that ends up being less good in the long run, potentially. And that's where I have a cringe moment about it. But I don't disagree with you. It is nice to know they're at a place where people are helping instead of demanding that they sell everything and give the church the money. So you're right. I'm not I'm not going to complain. I'm just, uh, yes, I'll accept that. For me, I've just kind of given up on the idea that they could possibly get out of this uh, before they pass. I've never been a believer of that old phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But maybe for them, it just... That's all they've known for so long. And I think they wouldn't feel comfortable if they got out. They, I don't think they'd be able to navigate this world because they've been so used to this one. And sometimes even what feels like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I was going to say slavery, but like feeling enslaved can also be comforting to yes. people. Because but it's a sure thing. Sometimes people feel comfort in just having someone tell them what to do. Same with like the military. I loved being in the military for quite some time just because I had gotten out of the church and um, I needed someone to tell me what to do. And I had, I was just given orders. You, when you deploy, you go and do your laundry, you go and get food, you just go and do your work and you go to bed. No questions asked. You just do what you're told. And there was something kind of comforting in that, you know, you're not out in the world trying to explore this and then seeing what a scary place it is. Well, right. It removes so many question marks because question marks are scary moving through this world mm -hmm. because we don't have all the answers and we're always learning and we're fucking up and learning by fucking up. And so all we, you know, and that, that doesn't feel great. And I think there's a, there has been in past generations, a huge push to feel like you know all the answers, like it's not okay if you don't. And so it feels unstable to not have all the answers. So of course that feels more stable. And when you have these church organizations that provide an answer, whether it's correct or not, um, people will just, they'll follow it. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Little bits of making sense. So we left off at the Christmas Eve sermon by Joseph W. Takash Sr. Now, remember, he is the one that took over when Herbert W. Armstrong died. In fact, he was ordained, well, he was made pastor general of the WCG nine days, I believe, before Herbie died. He's been running the show for a while. So 1994, Christmas Eve, and I love that they say Christmas Eve because we were never able to celebrate Christmas, and then all of a sudden it was like, well, the church changed, and now you can actually celebrate Christmas. Now, as I said in the last video, um, what had happened was Joseph Tkach was going around, um, and people were catching on to what was going on, the doctrinal changes. He was just in Atlanta, and he spoke to some people there, but the major announcement for his followers came out of Big Sandy, Texas, at the Ambassador University campus. And this was just a bombshell of an announcement because he said things like, um, he told people that the Old Testament is more or less obsolete and that they are a New Testament church now. And then he went through some of the changes. It was a really long sermon. I want to say it was over three hours long, too. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pastor General of the Worldwide Church of God, Joseph W. Tkach. I couldn't resist it. Well, anyway, greetings and a very pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Happy Sabbath to all of you. 
Well, I'm sure many of you had heard uh, quite a few rumors going around, flying left and, and right. And so hopefully I can put some of them to rest and uh, explain the others that uh, need not be put to rest. But I'm sure most of you have heard about the recent trip to Atlanta, uh, Georgia, where uh, it felt like I was between the rock and the hard place because I had received, prior to uh, going there, I had received a number of anonymous letters. Now, supposedly, from people who considered themselves good Christians, solid Christians, and I would, I would like to have hoped that uh, they were, but... Uh, by their actions, something, something was seriously lacking because they posed a threat to me. That hardly is the actions of someone who is deeply converted and who has internalized Jesus Christ in, in their character because they threatened that if I came to uh, Atlanta, Georgia and spoke about the Ten Commandments that they were going to stage a walkout. And then on the other hand, I received other letters saying that if I spoke about grace, that the other 50% were going to walk out. We are to encourage one another in faith and works of service. We are called to worship and to glorify God in Jesus Christ. Nothing could be more important. We are to support and encourage each other in that. And we can't do it when we're all accusing and backbiting each other. There can be a positive attitude. I don't see it. But this, this so revolutionizes our thinking and for our former way and, and everything else. I, you know, I don't understand it. But God helped me to absorb it and to internalize it and to understand it. And as a result, there's going to be fruit produced as a result. That's the spirit and the attitude of a real Christian. Not those that want to dig in their heels and say, I don't agree with it. Well, you can do that with the global if you want. You want to go back to legalism? Jesus established a new covenant on better promises. And he made the old covenant obsolete. The Bible clearly teaches us this much. And now this leads us to the obvious and difficult questions. What about the old covenant practices like tithing? Avoiding unclean meats? Keeping the Sabbath in the holy days? People, you know, the global is constantly accusing, we're going to do away uh, with, with the Sabbath, we're going to do away with the holy days, we're going to start observing Christmas and Easter and everything else. The Sabbath, for example, was sanctified at creation long before the covenant began. The distinction between clean and unclean meats existed in the days of Noah long before Abraham. The Passover began before Sinai, but the other holy days were instituted later. Circumcision and sacrifices began before Sinai too. Under the Old Covenant, tithing was required for the support of the Old Covenant ministers. No longer by the Old Covenant of 10%. You're all on your honor before God. We don't check tithing records anyway. Under the New Covenant, the tithe is voluntary. And I'm taking, in one sense, some people said, and I don't like to put it this way, I'm taking a big gamble, especially when we're under a, a real severe financial deficit. I can't help if, if people decide themselves that they're going to hold back their tithes. I've heard of it. There are people who are planning to hold back their tithes so that just when we're in a financial, uh, you know, real crunch, they're going to come to me, supposedly, a large group, I don't know how many, and they're going to say, we'll turn over our tithes if you will do thus and such. There are some things I'd like to say, but I'm, I'm a Christian. Don't be ashamed to invite some of your closest friends, your associates, to Sabbath services if the opportunity comes up. I don't mean go around and put a hammerlock on them and say, hey, you're going to go to church with me this Sabbath. No. I think we, we already went through that experience, how to, how to uh, lose friends and antagonize people in one easy lesson. We stood in horror when, when uh, relatives would come and visit with us. They say, can we come to church with you? No, you can't come to church with us. Like if we were some kind of exclusive club that, hey, you, know, they, you can imagine what they thought of us, that we're a cult. And we used to think we were unique. You know, when you're ignorant, you don't know that. We used to preach and teach that it was a lack of faith if you had insurance. And we had many 
of God's people driving automobiles around without any kind of insurance. Some people think that Christ liberates us from the law so that we can be more selfish. That's, that's the way they, they respond. That's false. He liberates us from the penalty of the law so that we can be free to serve him more. As loving children, not merely as slaves under the lash. Compared to the Pharisees, Jesus was an extreme liberal. Consequently, the way the Sabbath is to be observed under the new covenant differs from the way it was to be observed under the old. We're not doing away with it. The Lord of the Sabbath has come and the reality has replaced the shadow. So we need to avoid judging one another. He would rather see children spanked in the silence than to see them playing on the Sabbath. Some people call it a lack of faith, but other people call it being sensible. Some people want boundaries spelled out for them. Some people want us to continue to legislate character development, everything else. That's not our job. We are a new covenant church. Our relationship with God is based on faith in Christ and not on the old covenant. Some laws remain the same, some are obsolete, and some are applied in different ways. It's true that the Sabbath is not commanded as part of the new covenant in the way it is under the old covenant. It is all the more important and meaningful in this modern secular society. But it is not a yoke of bondage around our necks. God does not expect our Christians to go into poverty cycle to keep it. Absolutely not. And as I speak, one who puts who has put my job on the line over the Sabbath too, just as many of you have. Let's not get angry over it because, again, you're just displaying what, what your attitude is. Some people will rejoice about what I've said today. Some will criticize. We are saved by faith, not by rules, and certainly not by judging one another. And I'm sure that this is going to cause a lot of questions, and that's good. It shows that you're thinking. And hopefully, it's with a positive spirit and a positive attitude. Have a, have a good Sabbath and a profitable week. God bless you until we see you again. Do you remember any of this actually happening? You would have been like 12. No, I don't. I just remember the aftermath. You? I feel like I remember tenseness and a lot of hushed tone talking in our house. Okay. I re- but yeah. other yeah, other than that, I don't I don't feel like the impact of what those announcements meant really hit me. Yeah, we didn't see the aftermath till later, but so <clears throat> again, by this point a lot of people had already left because they had caught on to what was going on, especially some of the evangelists. They went off to make their own splinter churches. Now the entire congregation knows what's going on. Some people stayed, but a lot of people did not. We're going to go over the stats of that. Not long after the Christmas Eve sermon, we have our first splinter church. Okay, splinter church after the official announcement came out. All right. And this one was United Church of God, which still exists today. In fact, I think it's one of the largest, but I also think it's one of the lesser strict ones, if that makes sense. I know they're all strict, but I'm talking like, they're not like Philadelphia Church of God or Restored Church of God, where it's very dictatorial, shall we say. Um, United Church is a little more... fluffy and pretty. I think they even celebrate birthdays, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> my professor in college used to be a part of United. In fact, I think he is still a minister with United Church of God and said they did celebrate birthdays. So just one of many, but yeah, this is one of the major ones. A bunch of former members of the WCG got together in Indianapolis and had some sort of big meet. Um, I, I want to say hundreds of people were there and not long after the United Church of God Uh, was formed so it was just a collection of people but I believe the main guy was David Hume he was the presenter and president of the world tomorrow program all right I don't know if he was like actually the pastor general but he was pretty significant as far as um, decision making in this church I remember him I remember hearing his name from worldwide yeah he was he was pretty high up in, in the church 
So a lot of those guys, yeah, they went off to form splinter churches. He was no exception. He, of course, was excommunicated from the Worldwide Church of God. That was in 98. He disagreed with the doctrinal changes like so many did. And so United Church of God does have their own production to they produce Beyond News TV program as well as, you know, the free subscriptions. They all do that under some form. <laughs> it's a model. And I do believe he was excommunicated or he left this church not long after. And then he went on to found Church of God. Um, all right. I, let me give you the names of those two churches here, Pat. It's pretty funny. He had formed United Church of God, an international association. And the new church he founded uh, that later that same year, yeah, the same year, Church of God, an international community. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You remember me mentioning the significance of having Church of God in the name of these churches. It's like right. they're going to run out of names at some point. Well, but imagine if you had a product, you know, your church, that you had gotten a whole bunch of people to buy your product, and then they kicked you out, and you thought maybe if those people were going to look for your product again, they might search the same name and come to it more easily if it was very similar. True. There's also um, literature, there's websites and like an association for all the churches of God. Some of them are OK with being part of the Church of God community. Some are not. Some of them say, nope, don't go to those other churches. We are the only true church. Again, that's Philadelphia <laughs> or Church of God amongst them. You know how it goes. I'm <laughs> sorry. The whole we are the only true <clears throat> church thing is just it's it would be laughable if it wasn't so harmful mm -hmm. and it's been going on for thousands of years patty yep isn't that sad all right so sad no like really so sad yeah it, it is it is all right so again during this time we still have people uh putting out publications so that Former members of the Worldwide Church of God that did not want to stay for the dick. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to stay for the what? They didn't want to stay for the dick. Sorry. All right. They, did... <laughs> they didn't want to stay for the doctrinal changes. Um, so there were a few thing publications that came out. Servants, News Magazine. There was also In Transition, News of the Churches of God. Doesn't an in transition kind of sound like a menopausal magazine? Yes. Or one for, you know, transgender folks. There you go. There yeah. you go. Awesome. Actually, there should totally be a magazine like that. In transition. All right. Guess what, Pat? We have another person to talk about, as if you're not sick of him yet already. Garner oh, Ted Armstrong. There's some more. Oh, shenanigans. Garner Ted. Guess what? Garner Ted hasn't gone anywhere. He may have been more popular in the 70s, but he still has quite the reputation, even in the 90s. So we are brought now to the 4th of July, 1995. Something happened. Do you remember what may have happened? No? Nope. No, not okay. at all. Oh, of course, the church remains hush-hush about things. But remember, this is quite a few years that uh, Garner Ted and his father were estranged. Obviously, his father died <clears throat> years prior. But Garner Ted is still running his own church empire. That is the Church of God International. I just have to make sure that's correct. He had two stupid names for his church. <laughs> yes, Church of God International, and then it was Intercontinental Church of God. I mean... really. Yeah, really. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just. Ugh. So his okay. church was based. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> so his church was based in Tyler, Texas, where he's been for quite a while. And he, you know how he's always been kind of charming with the ladies. Well, in this case, he actually has a sexual assault charge placed against him. Oh, this guy <laughs> dark. Yeah. It got very dark. So what happened was he was seeing this 49-year-old massage therapist named Sue Ray Robertson. 
he was seeing her for a good three or four months every two weeks or so. So he was a regular visitor of hers. Uh, she had her own business in the basement of her like Victorian home. The original name of it was called. <laughs> OK, I shit you not. It was called Personal Touch Spa. I think there's probably like a thousand forty of those across the country. <laughs> The problem with this, I guess it started out okay, but she did say that Ted always insisted on being naked. I guess, okay, <laughs> that's something that I guess is at the discretion of the massage therapist. Some of them allow that. Um, Ted, no exception. He stated he wanted her to mostly work on his inner thighs, groin area, his ass, and his lower back because he had like this pain from constantly being in a vehicle driving and i'm just going to give some random tidbits here um she did mention that he had like a lot of tattoos when she would massage him including one of a naked woman i don't know if i've mentioned that before but he did have that tattoo as well now on this particular day fourth of july in 1995 she said he got much more bold and aggressive with her like the like the dichotomy changed a little bit as far as their relationship normally things would be okay he'd go and he'd have a massage and he would talk about things like his church she says that she didn't know who he was at first until he started talking about it wait wait wait. so these these massage sessions were for the areas you were talking about every time mm -hmm. and it was fine yeah okay i think All right, that's fine just clarify yeah I think, again, I, I don't know. It, it's at the discretion of the massage therapist. In her case, I think it, she just, he insisted on being naked all the time, having her go into the groin area and, you know, work some of those kinks out. <laughs> kinks is the right way to talk about it, I guess. I and keep in mind, the dude is 65 years old at the time. I don't know if he thinks he's still in the 70s and he's this young, good looking, charming guy. I mean, he's still a good looking guy for his age, 65, but. And he's not what he used to be. And so but I think he had forgotten that. And just he got so used to women throwing themselves at him that I think, oh, I just get bold, you know. You know, the whole, well, I, I, I'm rich, so I grab him by the pussy. Pretty much just like that. Kind of seems like with time and power, they sort of lose their grip on reality and autonomy. Well, <laughs> when you've been in power for so long and gotten what you've wanted for so long... Eventually, you just start taking it thinking that it's acceptable. Totally. Also, he's apparently drunk by the time he comes in, and it is 9 a.m. Now, granted, yes, it's 4th of July. Uh, Sue Ray explained that she just thought it was going to be another slow day because it's a holiday. No, nah, he's, already, he's already drunk when he comes in. She claims he started jerking off right on the table as she's, like, rubbing him down, rubbing his thighs and he begs her to give him some relief. The key to all of this is he's drunk. We are dealing with reduced inhibitions. Yeah. Not an excuse. Obviously. Not an excuse. Sorry. Not an excuse. Yeah, it's a combination of a couple different things with his cockiness and thinking he can get away with this stuff. He's drunk. He's... I don't know. The dude has always been sort of like a sex addict. Like, for real. That's a great point. I don't think you're wrong, Nance. And I don't think it went away over the years either. I mean, look uh, at this. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> and what stories will never be uncovered? I know. All <sighs> I can take is stuff that's public knowledge, stuff that, that uh, the victim had said. Uh, she said she refused but then he decided he was going to go ahead and grab her tits, grab her by the pussy. Yep. He did there that apparently. Uh, he also apparently tried to get her to go down on him at some point, which at that point she claims that she refused and then she went to go hide. Like she went into the other room, like the bathroom or something, and just kind of waited for him to leave because she was so scared. Um, <clears throat> and this is the first time she catches him in the act again. But what happens is she immediately contacts her ex-husband, Royce. She divorced him only a few months prior, but they were still in contact with each other. She told him what was going on. She didn't go to the police right away. And them to, they together went to go contact a lawyer to find out what they should do. 
And the lawyer suggested to catch him in the act because he is this man of high power and control in the Tyler, Texas area. People know him. They know who he is. And so this could be this could not end well for her because there's been other instances where there have been men of in high power situations with lots of money that can just simply make things disappear. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. there aren't people that come out like young women that try to exploit and get money out of men. Totally not what I'm saying. Um, Obviously, we know this happened because, well, here we go. All right. So they wanted to catch him in the act. And both by both people by this point knew very well who Ted was. And they knew the religious empire that he had. So a couple weeks later, on July 15th, Ted did did return for an appointment. Yes, he was that cocky. He just thought he didn't do anything wrong. Business as usual, going to get his massage. Probably thought he'd wear her down, get his BJ one of these days. Yeah, probably thought he'd wear her down. Yeah. So Sue Ray's ex-husband, Royce, he set up a camera behind the wall clock, and then he went upstairs to watch the video just in case something happened. Um, But yeah, they, they wanted to make sure he did the exact same thing that he did last time. According to Sue Ray, it was nowhere near as bad as what had happened the first time. That was like three or four times worse, but they were able to still, still catch him in the act. So Ted didn't disappoint with this next visit. So once again, he starts jerking off on the table again during the massage and he is seen grabbing her tits and trying to get her on top of him. At this point, um, Sue Ray claims that she said, uh, you know, that's not part of the massage. And then she continues on. Now, from my from my little point of view here, if I were a professional massage therapist, it, the massage would have ended immediately at that point. But well, again, yeah, they each their own. If a dude's jacking off on your uh, table, that would just not be acceptable. But again, I don't know what was going on in her mind at the time. She wanted to catch him in the act um, and being recorded. Of course, some people in the church say, well, she did this on purpose to um, get money out of him and so on. But I mean, he just started doing this on his own. She didn't she didn't do it. <laughs> we're focused. Well, but doesn't that point to how many times this probably happens, you know, in the real world? Yeah. <laughs> Not just in stories that that someone thinks that they have a right to this and and the the massage therapist doesn't know what to do and either right. joins in and feels gross or, you know, hides or gets hurt herself. I mean, Jesus. This guy was sleazy, wasn't he? I mean, he's He's never been faithful to that wife of his a day in his life, not even in his older years. Yeah, oh. sleazy is a good word. I did find out something interesting. Um, His wife, Shirley Ann Hammer, someone stated that she was actually engaged to Ted's brother Richard first um, a couple of years before he got killed in the car accident and that Ted got her pregnant and his father wasn't having it. He said, Ted, you have to marry this woman now to make an honest woman out of her. Again, I don't know how true that is. That's just something that I had uh, come across. At some other point in this series, I believe you said that his <clears throat> wife felt like she had just won the husband lottery or something. Right. Yeah. She was very into him for at least for a while. Yeah. Well, and she put up with a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this was publicized quite a bit. There were other massage therapists that came out of the woodworks um, kind of insulting Sue Ray, saying, well, I'm a massage therapist. If I had seen something like that, he never would have come back. I would have like probably called the police to get him out of there. But and then also people in the public eye for something like this, they try to discredit you. The the media may look into your background and try to discredit you. That's exactly what they did with Sue Ray as well. But we'll talk about it more in a bit. That was just the point at which that had happened. It will go on to um, be kind of a nasty uh, court case. Mm, Okay. All right. A few months later, on September 23rd, 1995, Joseph W. Tkach Sr., he dies of bone cancer. Uh, That was nine years after he had become pastor general. He was only 68. A lot of people speculate that he died kind of at an early age, because of so much stress that was placed on him from uh, the doctrinal changes of the church. I mean, they, they like lost everything. They lost so much money 
their credibility. They lost members, everything. And you can imagine he would have gotten probably death threats. So needless to say, not long after that, his son, Joseph Takach Jr., was appointed as pastor general of the Worldwide Church of God. They kept the name Worldwide Church of God. And the reason they did that for at least for a while um, was because they wanted to show like they believed God had done some sort of miraculous work here, bringing them through to um, the the grace of God. And um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like say the concept of save through grace. They wanted to show uh, what a what a miracle God had worked here. And so they, they right. kept the name for quite a few years. Garner Ted Armstrong, uh, he's making headways in the media here. And so people are not liking it. Obviously, members of the church aren't liking it because Sue Ray and her ex-husband are going after Ted's religious empire. I don't know. I'm a little confused by that. I don't know why they thought they could go after his church. I would have thought they could only go after him personally. But I would think so. Apparently they did. OK, they went after his church. Um, needless to say, I think Garner Ted had either resigned or he had been excommunicated because of the pressures from other people in his church. So the year 1996, I wanted to talk about a little bit of the stats on what was going on with the Worldwide Church of God and its very sharp decline. In 1990, before these changes started taking place, it was worth around 200 million. All right. After the official changes in doctrine, it reduced to 50 million. Whoa. The Plain Truth magazine subscription dropped from a peak of 8 million down to about 100,000. And that's before it even became a paid subscription. It was free. Then the number of employees at the church, at the headquarters, it fell from around 1,000 employees down to 50. So things were not looking good. No one can say that the leaders of the Worldwide Church of God made these doctrinal changes for money. That definitely wasn't the case. And they knew that. They knew they would lose money. I don't think they realized just how much. And that All was right. over well, the course of how long? That was like between, what, 94 when Tkach gave the speech? And then right. at what point had they dropped? Like, at what point had the plain truth dropped all the way down to that 100,000 mark? Uh, in 96. So that was the stat from oh. 1990 within those six years. By 96, that's what had had, had happened. Oh, okay. Because Takach Sr. had been making changes, but not really announcing it. Right. Well, he did officially announce it, as I said, um, in 94. Right, right. Okay. Wow. Right. All right. Uh, by 97, the Worldwide Church of God did become a member of the National Association of Evangelicals. So they are a member of the standard mainstream Christian evangelical crew. All right. That same year, we also have Joseph W. Dukach Jr. He wrote a book known as Transformed by Truth, and he wrote this trying to get the public to understand kind of what happened with Worldwide Church of God, his side of the story. May of that year, Ambassador College closed. And this is the headquarters in Pasadena. They just, they couldn't keep it any longer. A board of regents voted to close the institution. This was just after their 50th anniversary due to, you know, lack of funds. It yeah. happened quick. What year did you say that was? Nine, May of 97. Damn. And so the official doctrinal changes were announced in 94. By 97, the college closed. <laughs> mm. All right. No more dancing between the bushes. Get this. On July 11th, 1997, the Geraldo Rivera talk show interviews Sue Ray Robertson. And the title is called Getting Rubbed the Wrong Way. No, they didn't. Yes. Oh, if, come on, Geraldo. If people search for it, you can actually find the transcript of what was said between Sue Ray and Geraldo. It's interesting. You can get a lot of information there. But um, yeah, shortly after that, actually the next month, we have Sue Ray Robertson versus Church of God International. So Sue Ray... Sought compensation, of course, for personal injuries, which she alleged were sustained when she was sexually assaulted by Ted, uh, both physical and probably mental and emotional. 
Um, the church filed a motion for summary judgment, claiming that it was not liable for Robertson's injuries because Armstrong's alleged conduct was performed in his individual capacity. That's what I was wondering about as well. And it was not on behalf of the church. Mm, mm -hmm. The trial granted the summary judgment and severed the action against the church from the action against Ted. So I don't really know what happened at this point, if they settled in court or whatnot, but I know the church itself was not, did not end up being liable. Well, so you're saying that basically the Worldwide Church of God, which Garner Ted was long gone from, is like shedding members and falling apart and probably pushing some of them over to Garner Ted's church at the same time that Garner Ted is um, getting in trouble for waggling his thing, right? Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Gross. Wacky. Yeah. So that's interesting. Like, like both of the Armstrong empires kind of got exploded all at once. Yeah, it was interesting to look that up. Um, at first, Garner Ted had apparently said it wasn't him. He tried to claim it wasn't him on the on the screen. And then all those tattoos had come up. So he couldn't get away with it. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Apparently, one news reporter had told him that the only difference between you and Jimmy Swaggart is that we have your butt on video. Jimmy Swaggart was a big televangelist during this time. Yeah, Garner mm. Ted, he's done. I think he's out of the public now. He public he publicly apologized to his church, the members, wife and family. Of course, he never apologized to his victim. They never do. Did he slink off and disappear? He didn't. You know what he did? Started another fucking church. Exactly. Oh he my started God. he started. Okay, so he had Church of God International and the name of the other one, Intercontinental Church of God. The creativity is bursting at the seams. I'm telling you. <laughs> the same year in 98 when he started that church, also Living Church of God pops up. Roderick C. Meredith again. He starts this one. I think that is Charlotte, North Carolina based because he has just been fired from Global Church of God. You remember that one we talked about last time? Apparently, some of the leaders said he was just trying to be in charge. He mishandled funds, such as having members give tithes directly to him and not the church. That's a pretty good move. But most of the members of the Global Church of God apparently followed him over to this new one. As I mentioned before, I think it was like 80% or so of people had mm -hmm. done that. So, all right. There's a couple more splinter churches. I'm not going to get into all of them. I just wanted to cover some of the main ones. There was Church of God, a Christian fellowship, Church of the Eternal God, and so on. And there were a bunch of other lawsuits, too. There were lawsuits that I noticed involving Global Church of God. So all these splinter churches are kind of batting against each other at this point, too. Whether it's an another one of these dudes are founding another church and getting excommunicated from another one one is saying they're the true church and uh, like like children they're like children it was like the scramble for armstrongists right yes they they wanted that power for themselves okay like hungry hungry hippos they're all just like trying to grab them all into their into their little group in 1999 David C. Pack was actually part of the global church of god and he was excommunicated from it I don't know exactly what happened with PAC, but there was apparently some shit that happened like in Michigan and some other things. I don't even think I can find the details on that, but I just know he is not a good person. He is very misogynistic. Sometimes the things he has said has led to people's suicides. I can only imagine the sort of things that happen. And if if our own mother said that he was, you no, know, he's kind of controlling, that says a lot. Yep. And, you know, as soon as he got excommunicated from Global, you know what he did? He created his own church at this point. That is the restored church of God that we have today that thankfully our mother has just escaped from, but gone to another church. But she is out of there. He still has a lot of members. He still has way too many members. Also, in 1999, that is when our parents moved away. So we were living in rural Wisconsin 
And dad had been listening to Brother Stare of Overcomer Ministries. I don't remember for how long. I feel like it was quite a few months. Who knew that once they left the Worldwide Church of God, he would find someone so much worse than anyone in the WCG. So they moved away. Our family split apart because the doctor, the doctrinal changes. And then our father found the most fundamentalist, fucked up pastor he could possibly find, who was, you know, a false prophet. Well, I, I don't believe in prophets anyway. I think they're all false. So brother stare a little bit about his background. We could probably cover him more in detail in a separate episode. But he told our parents to get out of the cities, um, get away from all the other churches. They were forbid to, forbidden to go. Um, get rid of your TV. I remember when that happened because I couldn't watch Xena anymore. Thank you very much. I was pissed. <laughs> that was very critical to you in 1999. Yes, that was my show, Lucy Lawless. You were 17 at the time, right? Yes. 1999. Okay. Overcomer Ministry was not an official splinter church of the Worldwide Church of God. It's just that he taught a lot of the same things, including the Sabbath on the seventh day. And so a lot of people did go down to Walterboro, South Carolina to join his commune, which Walterboro is actually part of the Murda trial, which I believe is going on right now still. There's also a very high crime rate in Walterboro, last I knew. So our parents had moved there for a while. Um, they moved away from it now. The way dad got involved with Brother Stare was while he was working away from home. We were all, you know, in high school and stuff. And so we had to stay living where we were, but his job was two hours away. So he had a room that he called his flop um, over in Wisconsin Rapids where he worked during the week and then would come home on weekends. Well, I guess he didn't have anything better to do sitting in his little room there in the Rapids. And so he got himself a shortwave radio and uh, found Brother Stare. Armstrong started, his early roots started in radio as well with the Radio Church of God. And you can get away with things on shortwave that you can't get away with on other channels right. or other media. All right. By the year 2000, I had graduated high school. I went to live with another family who turned out to be... Uh, pretty mentally abusive. I didn't stay with them for long. And I moved to as many as probably 50 different places over the course of the next few years. Um, life was pretty rough for a while. I was on my own. You were in, you were in college. Yeah. Yep. I was so in college. By, by 2000. Yeah. I had left and just kind of wandered. Yeah. In those years after mom and dad um, decided to go down and live near the commune by brother Stare. I was a freshman in college when dad, I feel like I said this before, when dad lost his job and then the next year he hadn't gotten another job and he was deciding to move the family down to Brother Sears commune. And so it was kind of like, well, the house has sold, come get your stuff. So on a break from school, I got what I had left at the house and stashed it in my boyfriend's basement at the time. His parents were kind enough to let me do that. And, uh, and then I ended up moving, I think I counted 11 times between when they left and then by the time I settled somewhere after college. So not a ton, but it was it was kind of a lot of upheaval. And I, you know, pretty much owned what I could fit in the back of my Ford Ranger pickup truck with a grandpa topper on it. God, I love that thing. That was a rough period, wasn't it? Um, our mother did not agree with our father making this decision to just uproot the family. And I think you had told me, Pats, that mom even talked about uh, taking us children away into uh, some nearby town and letting dad just kind of go on his own. I think she was close to that point. But eventually she gave in. She didn't want to split up the family or somehow he had duped her into to going with him. And so they've been in South Carolina ever since. That story is maybe why I feel so proud of her for spending the last few years at Restora just to spite our dad and his uh, decision to uproot again where they were all going. She was probably pretty resentful of that. Yeah, I would think so. Also in the year 2000, the Worldwide Church of God ends up selling the Ambassador University Big Sandy campus. And you know who they sold it to? The company that owns Hobby Lobby. They just kept it within religious organizations. It sold for eight and a half million. Hobby Lobby ended up leasing the facilities to the Institute in Basic Life Principles. So that is a ministry of Bill Gothard. 
another just televangelist. Just keeping all the property within religious organizations. In September of 2000, we have the Worldwide Church of God versus Philadelphia Church of God. Ooh, here we go. Back in 1997, the Philadelphia Church of God announced it was going to republish and distribute Herbert W. Armstrong's 1985 book, Mystery of the Ages, one that we have read through a little bit, found it incredibly racist. They wanted that book. They wanted to give it to their people. So the WCG immediately filed a federal lawsuit against them for distributing illegal reproductions of the book because whether the doctrines changed or not, Worldwide Church of God had the rights to that book still. But the WCG had stopped printing the book, of course, because they didn't believe with the teachings anymore, but they still own the rights to it. It was quite a few years at this point that Armstrong had died and they still own the copyright. So both of these churches fought a legal battle that spanned for several years, ending in 2003 when the WCG agreed to sell full copyrights of not only Mystery to the Ages, but also 19 other works that sold for $3 million. I don't know if Philadelphia actually sold the book or if they gave it as like a free distribution to people like Armstrong did. Another book comes out uh, the next year by Mike Fizell. He's part of the Worldwide Church of God, and it's known as The Liberation of the Worldwide Church of God. So this is just another of many books that had come out from the Worldwide explaining their side of the story and what happened with the changes of the doctrine. Uh, 2001 is also when <laughs> Gerald Flurry opens his Herbert W. Armstrong College in Edmond, Oklahoma. We did talk about that. He's still sucking the guy's dick even after he's dead. Absolutely. May of 2002, I thought it was um, important to note that our parents are still over there in Walterboro, South Carolina, and Brother Stair has been arrested for sexual assault of minors. There was a 17 and 20-year-old girl. Both had come forward to explain that he has been uh, molesting them. Brother Stair is 69 years old at this point, and I think he spent a good 77 days uh, uh, in jail for that. But nothing else really became of that. Also in 2002, we haven't heard about Stanley Rader for quite some time. He's been out of the game for a long time but he did end up dying on july 2nd 2002 so and he's gone at this point so what was all of that for did he enjoy his life with all of that money oh, was it like fun for him was he happy oh i think he had fun for a while he was living well he was living very well but then i think after that um situation where it was the state of california versus worldwide church of god it seems like he was still involved with Worldwide, but he was no longer like the accountant and personal assistant. He just kind of went away in the woodworks. Maybe he retired. Mm. I don't know. But he's, but he has not been in the public eye, I think, since like the 70s, early 80s. The following year in 2003, Garner Ted Armstrong also dies at age 73 due to complications oh. of pneumonia. But yeah, Garner Ted is no more, and um, I wasn't really going to touch on Armstrong's grandchildren at all, but I did want to mention that his Garner Ted's son, Mark, um, Armstrong's grandson, was made president and chairman of Intercontinental Church of God, which was the new splinter church that Garner Ted created after he was kicked out of the other one, Church of God International. Oh, my God. I don't know how I'm keeping track of all these churches because <laughs> the names are so similar. By 2004, there's a little documentary that comes out called Called to be Free. I remember seeing this quite a few years ago, but I didn't really think much of the Worldwide Church of God in the years following me like getting out. Like I, I just wasn't interested. I was interested in living my life, finally being free. But in this case... The Worldwide Church of God created this documentary to show, because again, they thought it was some kind of a miracle of God that, that the church changed, even though it's struggling so bad now. It's worth watching for people who were in the Worldwide, even if um, they're atheists like us, or uh, if they got out and they're Christians now, definitely worth watching because it's from a Christian standpoint, um, but it does give some good information on um the church and what happened uh they do interview some of the members and that is available for free on youtube jump a few years later to 2009 worldwide church of god changes its name to grace communion international i guess they were done with the name so um that church still exists not very big uh they're based out of charlotte north carolina now 
In 2010, Armstrong's youngest daughter, Dorothy, ends up dying in Arizona. Uh, she was the one who had um, apparently been the victim of um, Armstrong's pedophilia. Yeah. Ugh. She was never in the public eye. She was never part of the church from what I understand, but I think all of his kids are are dead now. 2015, Gerald Flurry writes a book called The True History of God's True Church. Oh, Jesus. Lining up to read that piece of artwork, huh? It'll just be, yeah. <sighs> just be stroking his own dick while reading it. All so right. much time spent on things that matter so little to what humans actually need to be doing. Right. To live on planet Earth together. Yes. Yeah. Look all the way off, Gerald Flurry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm so tired and <sighs> I am too. I am too. They can't they can't splinter <clears throat> far enough. Well, we are gonna continue doing this until they go away. It's all it's all we can do. We gotta do our part. So yeah. David C. Pack can fuck all the way off too. <laughs> I mean, those are the two I really have, I, I really take issue with. I'm not saying there's not more out there. You know there are. But the ones with the loudest voices would be David C. Pack and Gerald Flurry. And maybe the most depth of manipulation and misogyny, as noted. Correct. Yes. All right. We're almost done with this timeline, Pats, and I'm so relieved. So Brother Stare with his tiny little commune outside of Walterboro, South Carolina. He's 84 by this point, and he's arrested a second time. Our parents are still with him, I think, at this point, correct? I think really? they had, like, found restored or something by then. Oh, I'm sure ba David C. Pack was very appealing to our father. So at the moment that he could move over there, I'm sure, yeah, he did. But Brother Stair had uh, criminal charges against him, state and federal. An investigation was being conducted for um, criminal Sexual conduct, kidnapping, burglary, and assault. Apparently a lot of infants had died on his commune because he just denied the medical care. And then Overcomer Ministry ceases to be a broadcast citing legal difficulties by the fall of 2018. <laughs> yeah. No shit. You're done for, you shit. As far as I know, um, he was out on bail, Brother Stair. Uh, went back to his home. He got to be around his family. And then he died in 2021. So that wasn't that long ago that he actually died. And unfortunately, his victims felt like they didn't get they didn't get justice. But he's dead now. So it's over and done with. He was just another one of these terrible religious leaders that took advantage of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then by 2019, uh, Joseph W. Dukach Jr., he retires from Worldwide Church of God. Others are running it now. Um, I want to say in 2021, so like the year Brother Start Brother Stare died, our dad actually um, was disfellowshipped from Restored Church of God. I think that's when that took place. Mm -hmm. Again, he wrote this long letter to David C. Pack, ex trying to get a sense of what constituted a day. David C. Pack wasn't having it. I think the two brawled, and then Dad was kicked out of the church. And then for a while, our mother stayed, and now we recently found out just. On Mother's Day a couple of days ago, she's with the Church of the Great God now, where our father is at. Still Armstrongest, though. Yeah. Still Armstrongest, but um, a little bit better. So that is all of the timeline. I hope everyone got something out of it. I am relieved for that to be done because that was so fucking much research. It was unbelievable. This kind of material could be turned into a movie, if I'm being honest. Holy shit. This could be a movie, except it's kind of boring because it's just old white men backstabbing each other. Yeah, but I think Garner Ted would create interest in a movie like that, at least, you know. There could be sex scenes then. Yeah, there could be a lot of sex scenes. It could be a movie. I thought that was important that we put in our episode list the timeline of the church and Armstrongism. So that everyone knows what happened. I, I'm assuming there are probably some people that have watched this and don't know anything about the church. Well, you know now, don't you? There were things in there that even some of the members didn't know. I didn't know. You didn't know, right, Pats? I mean, well, no. I mean, we were just kids in the 80s. We for sure didn't know the history stuff. What an absolute fucking shit show. A very wise woman in my life says that the only real currency is power. And it seems to me 
that that is what was happening there in the upper echelons of the worldwide church of God as everyone vied for power, even as it was falling apart. I think awareness is going to help too. Um, organizations that have like cult recovery, making sure people notice um, <clears throat> what makes a cult. Are you in a cult? I, and I think the information that we got from the safe conference that we just attended is going to be great for our next episode. We'll talk about what constitutes a cult, how to recognize it, maybe help people that are are stuck in these ideologies too, to get out, to be free, to live their lives. The thing that I think was so important about what we learned at that conference and about the various facets of what constitutes a cult is that it isn't just about a cult. Those same things can be applied to abuse situations, you right. know, domestic, yeah. domestic type abuse. It's the same kinds of behaviors just applied on a group scale instead of a single person to single person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just harder to recognize. Oh, it's much harder to recognize. And I often wonder, like they all sort of share the same characteristics. How do they know this stuff? Like that, that dictator mentality, like, do they all know just how to do people? Like they're so good at it. They're so good at it. And there can be things like grooming um, young uh, children at a young age, sexual assault, taking advantage of people financially, um, making them promises that they can't even deliver on until the person's dead. I mean, it it really is a a genius marketing tool. People like Joel Osteen have it down to an art. I mean, well, when these people are growing up in our world that requires us to make money to survive and in fact glorifies well it, it doesn't just glorify i mean it is where you can live a better life if you make more money and so that seems like the goal right so i think when people absorb that idea as the goal of life and you can even dress it up with you know god says to make it to make it seem righteous Right. Then all of a sudden they can justify any darn thing mm -hmm. in the pursuit of spreading the word. And they don't have to worry as much about what actual real life harm is happening to people because they've totally convinced themselves they're doing the right thing that God says. And the culture shows them that they are because they're getting money and having a good life and getting pats on the back and getting, you know, women to suck their dick whenever they want. Everything, all the feedback they get tells them that what they're doing is right. And so it keeps happening, which is why we're doing what we're doing, because we need to interrupt that uh, disgusting feedback loop mm -hmm. and recognize that we don't have to give them our power. Yes. Yeah. We retain our power, even mm -hmm. over the people who have authority over us. We always have our power. Amen, Pets. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking amen praise jesus no i will not no. okay that's fair i don't think he exists i'm not gonna praise anyone i don't think he's <laughs> stupid i think our big spiel we had in the last episode was kind of meant for this one but um that's okay um anytime we have a hot take and we want to discuss things like release some of that um complex trauma that we have I, I'd say we go ahead and do it whenever we have a thought. If we need to cry it out, be angry, um, talk about details of the church like this, uh, whatever it takes for us to heal, connect with other people, we, we've got to trust our instincts on it. That sounds like deconstructing publicly, Nancy. And be cycle breakers. Break yes. the fucking cycles. Break the fucking cycles. Yeah. It stops with us. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people um, in person, online, they say, oh, I, I'm, just, I'm just a Baptist. I'm not really a Baptist, but I just go because, you know, my grandmother wants me to go. And so they feel they feel stuck. People feel like they have to do things to please other people. And, and they're they're completely neglecting themselves. People do things to feel like they have to make other people happy to please other people. But then it's like you, you're disloyal to yourself. You're cheating mm -hmm. yourself. 
And that's not good for anyone either. Right. I noticed that especially in parent-child relationships, because if there's any money, like inheritance type money, Mm -hmm. I mean, then that parent has power over the child because they can say, do what I want. Or this inheritance money is, you know, maybe maybe you're going to be written out of the will. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the levels of control that, that these things can radiate out into would probably blow our minds. And you add that much money into the mix, too. Not that the Worldwide Church of God folks had any, because... Not the members, no. Not the members. Not the members, yeah. But the higher-ups in the church definitely did. I do feel much more connected to our parents. I feel like I do understand them better. And that was my goal in completing this. And now others online can look at our timeline and say, well, I don't really know anything about this church. So you can go through. I didn't intend for it to be this many episodes, But I just kept finding so much information. Like, okay, well, yes, we are done. We're done. Cheers. So here's one for you, David C. Pack. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Uh, There's so many artists here that think for themselves.